Hey, hi. Hi, world. My name is Jeff Joseph. I am the Senior Vice President of Communications with the Consumer Electronics Association here in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. For those of you who don't know us, CA represents over 2,000 companies across the entire spectrum of consumer technology, from uh, big companies like Google and Apple, um, LG, Samsung, to small startups, retailers, everyone in between. We're probably best known for uh, producing each year the International CES, the world's gathering place for everyone and anyone who's engaged in the business of technology. Um, I'm here today with uh, Ross Rubin. Ross is a principal analyst at Reticle Research, which he founded in 2012, uh, and he focuses on consumer technologies. Ross is a blogger at Techspressive. You might see his weekly column uh, at Engadget or at ABC News Online. Um, he's a graduate of Cornell University, um, and you can follow him on Twitter at, at Ross Rubin. I also have here today, hi Ross, how are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. I also have Sean Dubrovac, who's our, our chief uh, uh, economist and director of research at CEA. Uh, Sean has a PhD in economics from George Mason University. He's a frequent speaker on topics related to economics, to technology, consumer technology, finance. He sits on the board of directors for the National Association of Business Economists, uh, and he's a baseball fan, and you can follow him at, at Two Opinions. Good morning, Sean. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. We're here today to talk about um, what we call five technologies to watch. Each year, CA identifies five technologies that we think are changing the world, that have the most promise, um, that, are, that are creating uh, new markets. Um, and we'll be discussing this at CA's upcoming industry forum. This is uh, in Los Angeles from October 20th through 23rd. Um, and our panel is actually on the 22nd, I believe. Um, but today, we're going to talk a little bit about the so-called Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything. Um, just last August, um, the Oxford English Dictionary actually added the phrase Internet of Things to its uh, pages along with its interesting Bitcoin, um, Selfie, uh, Twerk, um, and Poha. I, I just, I love. Um, so tell me what, Sean, Sean or, or Ross, what is the Internet of Things? What do we mean when we talk about that? Um, well, um, let's just hope Miley Cyrus doesn't get um, involved in it. Uh, I guess we can start with that. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, <laughs> right. uh, I think uh, you know, one, one of the interesting things about uh, the, the Internet of Everything or, or the Internet of Things, as it's sometimes called, uh, is that it's such a new area that we, we see a lot of adjacencies to um, other, other developing uh, areas in technology. There are ties to uh, areas like telemetry. There are ties to what's called M2M or machine-to-machine uh, communication, their ties to sensors and wearables. So um, we're early enough in the evolution of this that the definition is, is a little bit uh, amorphous. Uh, I tend to take more of a holistic uh, view uh, and that it includes a lot of the things that are already internet enabled today are, are smart devices, uh, PCs, um, uh, smartphones, tablets, etc. And it's just uh, taking some of that, uh, some of what we've seen in those categories and really proliferating it across a lot of kinds of products that have really never had intelligence or connectivity uh, before. Uh, things that could include uh, uh, products like energy uh, consumption meters, uh, thermostats, uh, doorknobs, uh, locks, um, uh, really uh, re refrigerators and other appliances. Um, sensors that are, are worn on the body, fitness uh, gadgets. So uh, it, it, it's really taking the internet and, and extending it to collect data and extend control to uh, a wide range of uh, products that heretofore uh, have not that <clears throat> have not had that intelligence or connectivity. Sean, we see a lot of these products already in the marketplace. Rob, Ross uh, talked about some uh, uh, fitness devices, monitors, and we've seen smart appliances in the marketplace for, for a while. So what's different as we talk about the Internet of Things now? What's, what's changed? I think as Ross hit on it, we started with these, uh, what we would consider computer devices. Laptops first, and then you bleed that into some of the newer computing devices we've seen move to mass market over the last couple of years, smartphones and tablets. And the, the key to me, really, of the Internet of, of Everything and the Internet of Things is that we start to deploy this first connectivity and then ultimately intelligence to everyday things. So, you know, one of the things I see as we look at the evolution of technology 
when something moves from a scarcity to a, to a uh, surplus in technology, we tend to waste it. If you go back to computing power, it used to be a scarcity, and we used it very sparingly. We used to have to check it out from universities. We used to have to borrow it, we, you know, queue up and, and get access to it. And then it moved from a scarcity to an abundance, and we started to waste it. So you think back to 1981 when Apple launched the, the uh, Macintosh. They were kind of the first commercially successful company to have a graphical user interface. Prior to that, we would have never wasted computing power on producing a, a mouse icon or folders on a screen. And we're there today now with sensors. So sensors went from a scarcity to an abundance. 2006, 2007, Nokia launches a phone in 06, and of course Apple launches the first iPhone in 07. Those are first phones only had one really main sensor or a couple of main sensors on them. Uh, they only had an accelerometer, for example, and if you look at the most recent iPhone 5, it includes a gyroscope, accelerometer, digital compass, the, the uh, microphone is now a digital you know, MEMS device, so we've deployed these sensors widely and we've moved from a simply a scarcity to an abundance and so we can start to deploy those across any number of things, thermostats, door locks, and you, you start to see the devices that are doing that. But I've even seen sensors deployed on things like surfboards. Surfboards. And then measure wave height, and you can measure speed, and you can get real-time feedback from how you're surfing and where you, you know where your bottom turn should be made or, or whatever. So literally deploying these sensors widely across everyday things, not just the, uh, the computer devices that we think of. We saw at CES in January moisture sensors that were uh, deployed to measure plant uh, moisture and you could then it would be alerted if your plant needed more water or if you weren't uh, you know living up to being the the uh, gardener that you should be in and so you can get that response so, so it seems to me this raises a host of issues let's start with that data issue so you have all these devices throughout your home in the water um, surfing wherever you may be collecting all this information and data um, let's let's start with the obvious um, what are the implications for big data and, and for, for bandwidth? How do we, you know, we already have a bandwidth crunch. How do we support all these devices now talking to each other and, and, and collecting, uh, collecting information? Let's start with the bandwidth issue, Ross. So, um, first off, I, I think Sean uh, raised a, a really interesting historical lesson in terms of um, how uh, we applied computing power to present a user interface. And, one of the characteristics of uh, this new generation of connected devices uh, is that very often they won't have or, or even need a native user interface. They're, they're not things that consumers um, uh, need to interact with very often uh, or at all. And adding a display or, or uh, buttons, uh, a touch interface, things like that, <clears throat> would just add a lot of cost uh, to uh, and, and perhaps complexity even uh, to a product that uh, that doesn't necessarily need it. So, so this ties back to your your question about data because the way we will uh, make use of that connectivity is getting uh, a stream of data uh, from these um, uh, from these devices. Now, one question is uh, who uses that data? Who where is the data going, and uh, uh, to which party is it delivered? In some cases, it may be delivered to the user, and it may be um, restricted to a, a small number of personal devices. Um, in some cases, uh, as in, say, a meter reading example, you're going to get aggregate data from thousands, perhaps even millions of devices um, wirelessly sending uh, information uh, from um, uh, many different endpoints to a, a central uh, central server. and so. We're seeing, uh, as a lot of these devices communicate wirelessly, we're seeing uh, carriers, for example, start to launch these wholesale uh, services um, to, to corporations that, that need uh, this kind of uh, bandwidth. I, th I think the good news is that in many cases it, it's very simple messaging. It's, it's status updates. Uh, however, when you do uh, deploy it over a huge scale, it, it does add up to a lot of data. Exactly, and, and, and again, back to those bandwidth issues. You know, Sean, Ross mentioned uh, this, this sort of collection of information, and in some cases it may be within that personal network, or whatever we want to call that, but in some cases it's going to go to these big data centers, and, and while it may be collecting the aggregate, we've certainly seen news stories that, that doesn't always work, that doesn't always seem to be the case. Who's responsible for, for 
the oversight of that data and for ensuring that, uh, that we're protecting privacy. Um, is, it, is it the users, or the consumers? Is it up to the data collection? Is it up to the, the actual device manufacturers or service providers? And I think a lot of those details are getting sorted out right now. I think and then the first question is how valuable is some of this information? I think we tend to think, oh, all of our information, all of our health information or our location information, all of that is extremely valuable and we should be heavily compensated for it should it be misappropriated or lost. And, and in fact, you know, m a lot of that data isn't extremely valuable. While we might find it um, neat and useful, it's not always kind of valuable in the, the tr traditional monetary sense that companies can e exploit every ounce of it. Well, let, me, let me just interrupt for a second, but it's not just about the, the, the potential monetization, right? It's just about, what, you know, I may not want the world knowing that I'm a terrible gardener. That, that right. the example you gave, I may not want my, my mother to know that I haven't learned any of her gardening skills and I'm not watering my plant. Who makes that decision? Right, and I think, I think, you know, companies are still trying to figure that out and individuals are still trying to figure that out. So I think we'll see like we do throughout the evolution of technology, backlash when some of that information gets uh, misappropriated if consumers decide that it was in fact valuable and that they did want it you know, kept uh, very secure. So whether it's um, you know, your moisture content of your potted plants or something else, you know, the consumers will respond to that data being being used outside of what they wanted to. So consumers want to be able to control their user experience. They want to be able to control that data as well. They want to be able to have a say in how that data gets used. I, th I think also as you try to get um, more integration uh, with different systems that you may be interacting with in your life, uh, the need for um, uh, a, a third party to come in and help manage that service grows. So, for example, you know, if uh, if you just ha are wearing a little pedometer, a connected pedometer, and the relationship there is between, uh, you know, you, the device maker, and and perhaps its website or its smartphone app, uh, the uh, and 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 the company that uh, that makes the smartphone. You know, that, that's probably something that's uh, quite a bit uh, easier to manage. Once you start getting into something like managing a digital home, well, now you have a lot of different interactions. You have lighting systems. You have uh, heat and heating and cooling systems. You may have garage door openers and security systems. And so, you know, that's why we're, we're seeing a lot of attention uh, in this space from uh, wireless carriers, uh, security uh, companies, and, and other companies that, Consumers already have a trusted uh, relationship with and a billing relationship. Yeah, and a billing relationship, importantly, right? Yes, well, for the, for the companies, yes. Yeah, exactly. No, no, that makes sense. I come back to a point you made there in, in a second. But um, so if you have all these various services and various devices talking to each other at home, collecting data, does that raise standards issues? Is this, there's a need for the creation of new standards? Um, I, I think there are some standards issues. You know, one of, one of the questions uh, raised is, how live does this connection need to be at all times, and does it indeed need to be an IP uh, connection? You know, for years we've had uh, a number of different standards at play in the home, um, uh, particularly in the uh, you know high, higher end residential systems uh, markets. We've had uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave, and you know these other very low power uh, standards to handle messaging. Um, now we're we're seeing Bluetooth. Uh, come into the mix. We're seeing Apple launch this uh, iBeacons um, capability that uh, that is built on a Bluetooth low energy. We're seeing a lot of NFC uh, kinds of things for initiating messages. So um, one one of the challenges really comes down to to low power uh, for for a lot of these sensors. You know, where are these things going to be? Uh, if they're plugged in all the time, then power becomes fairly irrelevant and you can use Wi-Fi or, or Bluetooth or, or you know, uh, existing standards. If it's going to be something that's out in your yard or at a remote uh, home or office um, uh, where, where you don't want to have that stuff plugged in all the time uh, and you need battery life of years, uh, then, then it becomes a lot more challenging. So, it's a, so another issue is, is, is the, uh, the power. Sean, are you going to add anything? No, I, I mean, I would just echo some of those things that Ross mentioned, um, and I would say that some of these standards or, or some of these 
you know, I, I don't know if we want to call them per se standards, but some of these protocols, protocols. that have developed protocols, uh, <laughs> protocols. are going to facilitate the deployment of the Internet of, of everything, and even though they might not have originally been intended to deploy the Internet of everything. So you know, we see technology evolve sometimes in very well-managed ways, and we see it sometimes evolve in ways that were kind of un unpronounced or unrecognized. And I think if you look at the use of like low power Bluetooth uh, protocols and, and some of the other, you know, the wide deployment of, of Wi-Fi networks, all of these facilitate the uh, the Internet of Everything. And so that's just a piece of it. And I, I think Ross, you know, hit on another important aspect of it too. Right now, a, a lot of the, you know, 10 billion plus devices that are connected are connected to um, just a single interface or a single, um, you know, single, single what I like to call curation tool. So if it's a connected pedometer, it's connecting up to the cloud and then that information is being aggregated and it's being delivered back to you maybe through an, uh, an app on your smartphone or through a, a website. But it's not necessarily pulling in a variety of other streams of data. Mm -hmm. and I think one of the next big things uh, for the Internet of Everything is to start to pull in all of this other information, right? You, where you really start to get robust algorithms is when you've got multiple, what we might call independent variables. So it's your location, it's pedometers, it's you know pressure sensors that are measuring height, it's um, uh, all of these other aspects that take into account uh, the full holistic view of your existence, not just these kind of one-offs. Right now we have a lot of one-offs and the next decade I think will be defined by all of these these different fibers coming together to create a much more holistic view and that's where you'll really start to get meaningful recommendations I think. I agree. It, 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 so it makes a lot of sense in the healthcare space for example I was having a discussion with, uh, with my parents about uh, the, the benefits of the internet of everything and the ability you get out of bed and you, you touch a, uh, a, a scale that measures your weight um, you've got sensors around the house to see how much you're moving but, it, but to your point over time you'll be able to collect all that data and give you a robust picture of your health right? Yeah it'll be able to give you a robust, you know, a robust picture of your health but also other things so right now Netflix uses very sophisticated algorithms to to provide recommendations about what you should watch based upon what you've watched before, or maybe what your friends or others who have watched similar things have liked. But there's no reason that couldn't be tied into all different kinds of information, like where you're at, the time of the day, um, you know, the type of things that you've liked during different, different periods of the day or, or different periods of the year. And then also all of your health information. Okay, we see that you've got, uh, you know, a high... Uh, blood pressure today or your heart rate's low. In the past, you really liked these type of movies when you've been in the same type of physical uh, setting or the same type of, you know, your health measures have been the similar. And so you can start to have very customized interactions, not just around health, but literally around all aspects of our, of our life. What we eat, what we, where we decide to go, um, what we watch. All of these things can start to be dictated by data, by information that, that was always there but not being captured in a digital way. And so that's, I think, a big uh, outcome of the Internet of Everything is that we're now starting to capture all of this information in a digital way. And once we have it in a digital way, then we can start to um, pull things together. And, and we haven't gotten there yet where we're starting to pull things together, but we're moving in that direction. So we, we talk a lot about the benefits of the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, but as you describe it, 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 it sounds a bit like every <laughs> horrific science fiction movie I've ever seen. Right? Yeah, that's right. Guy net come to life. I'm literally waiting for Neo to come pop up next to me and say, <laughs> save you. So, so, so again, Ross, those concerns about, well, let me, let me ask it this way. Um, you know, we're enthusiastic. We're all tech fans. We think this is a great thing. We see the benefits. But um, will consumers accept this? Is it is they think about being monitored all the time or having their activities monitored and and their devices responding to their moods and and physiology? Um, are, are, what tells us that, that this will be a marketplace success? Well, clearly one one of the variables for that is the perceived benefit from the consumer. You know, um, if you were to uh, ask uh, consumers uh, 15 years ago 
uh, do you want a camera uh, in your living room? Um, they would have probably, uh, you know, held, held up their hands and, and run away. Uh, and then, you know, Connect comes along and it becomes one of the best-selling, um, you know, video game peripherals of, of all time. So um, the, uh, the the benefit, you know, and, and Sean alluded uh, to a lot of this, uh, is, uh, is 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 a life, you know, that's that's uh, that can be. Uh, made made richer uh, and and the power to make better decisions. Um, you know the data, uh, all this data is is useless um, or, or at least of limited use uh, unless it can be made actionable. So so it's not just the stream of data; it's it's the intelligence uh, and and the recommendations uh, to to act on it. Otherwise, you know it's it's like if you had a navigation device in your car. Uh, that just gave you a stream of coordinates, you know, and, and here, go to this latitude and longitude position, you know, that, that's valid data, uh, but, but it wouldn't be very actionable, you know, it, it takes bringing that together with, with mapping data and, and things that are relevant to you in the real world uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to make that valuable, and, and similarly, uh, consumers, are, you know, time and time again show that they are willing to uh, share uh, information about themselves, uh, often with trusted parties, sometimes without, uh, some, sometimes uh, to non-trusted parties, uh, if they uh, if they perceive some benefit. You know, uh, again, look at social networking services and how popular they are, and how much information uh, consumers voluntarily give up um, uh, for a system that will facilitate communication and photo posting and other things they want to achieve. I mean, look at coupons, right? Everybody, yeah. Americans love to scream that they, their data is proprietary and they don't want to share it. Throw 10% off some purchase at them, and they're quick to give you all well, the loyalty cards. Yeah. <laughs> right. So my privacy is worth about a 10% discount. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I think though there are there are some real risks out there, right? The first time a homeowner comes home and his thermostat has been um, hacked. Yeah, it's hacked and, and it's 85 degrees in his house rather than 65 degrees in his house. He's going to second guess the um, the need for some of these things, the need for having it connected, the need for sharing it. Now, like technology, there's always going to be, and technology is going to evolve and innovate as fast as people are, are uh, coming on to to disrupt that. So you, I mean, spam's a great example, right? We used to get a lot of spam, so we implemented spam filters, and so to try to get around spam filters, you saw spammers start to change the way they spelled things and using different characters so they wouldn't get picked up by spam. So there's this constant iterative battle between those who are trying to use technology for good versus those that want to be disruptive for in, any number of reasons. And that same thing is going to play out with the Internet of Things. Very well. Uh, so as we go back to the bullish side, how, do we have an estimate of how large the market will be for uh, the so-called Internet of Things? Okay. Cisco's put out a bunch of numbers um, as far as the number of things that have been connected. They estimate 8 to 10 billion devices are connected to the Internet Correct. as of the end of last year, growing to you know 15 to 20 billion in the next couple of years, and maybe by 2020 we're at 40 to 50 billion connected devices. So... 2008, 2009, we already surpassed the number of connect the number of connected devices surpassed the number of individuals out there, and that continues to to accelerate. So, literally everything around you today could be connected, and I if it's meaningful to connect it, I think you'll see it eventually get connected in some way. And there's going to be plenty of things that that don't need to be monitored or don't need to be connected. But we're seeing a, a wide uh, distribution of sensors, and, and we're seeing sensors integrated into a, a large number of things. So you can imagine any number of things that can be measured will be measured. So, so you guys have sort of surveyed the landscape and looked at all these, these devices, and we have about five minutes left, by the way. What, what are you most excited about? You don't have to give away brand names. What have you seen that you're like... That is a great implementation of sensors, and, and I really see the opportunity here as, as we think of the Internet of Things that the, this device will play a role. I'll start with Ross. I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, things in the home, um, so uh, I think it's worth taking a moment to talk about 
some things out of the home. Um, uh, I think there's a great potential for indoor mapping uh, technologies, little tokens that uh, could be placed um, in within stores, for example, the mall or, or even classrooms at a university to help people who are unfamiliar uh, with uh, with a new location get around. It's sort of the equivalent of, um, of what what GPS uh, did did for driving on the outside. Uh, with uh, with these small sensors, uh, we can uh, help people find their way to places much more uh, much more efficiently uh, than ever. Um, in in restaurants, uh, we can uh, uh, help provide a better better service. We can. Uh, find out when uh, when drinks are uh, need, need to be refilled, or uh, when people are ready to order, when they put their menus down. Um, so, uh, so I, I think uh, it's important to think about how consumers will benefit, uh, even in in ways uh, that reflect uh, business investments. John, how about you? What have you seen that that you were like, wow, that's really cool. I really see the the opportunity, the advantage of this this connected device. But look at autonomous vehicles. So last year, Google's driverless vehicles drove 300,000 miles. Uh, estimates are by 2020, 2025, we start to see more mainstream deployment of driverless vehicles. Google's driverless car is nothing more than a Prius with a bunch of sensors strapped to the top and strapped around it and taking in into account all of that information. So really, a driverless vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, is a... Uh, you know, an internet of everything. I've seen that um, also show up with tractors. Some of the tractor companies now are integrating sensors. John Deere's working on it. There's a few others to make those autonomous. So you can literally become more efficient. So there's a whole, and we talk about consumer way of life and that becoming easier, but there's also a lot of productivity that can be driven out of uh, the Internet of Everything. And so there's a lot of economic growth and a lot of promise around uh, the Internet of Everything. So, you know, we're, we're kind of connecting textbooks, for example. Let's talk a second about education. As textbooks go to digital, you can start to monitor and measure all of that information. How long did a student spend on a page? Um, how many pages did he skip? All of that information can be measured and monitored and provided back to the student, to a teacher, to a parent to help them understand what aspects are they not grasping. Where can they, you know, where could they benefit from extra tutoring or where should we help? What, what concepts are too difficult? By connecting all of these devices and then starting to measure all of this information, you can start to provide real-time feedback so, uh, so literally you can catch a student slipping before they've slipped too far. Um, there's, I think, a lot of productivity enhancing activities that can take place. Supply chains can become more efficient. Um, you know, Ross talked about getting better recommendations at a restaurant or having better service. I mean, all of those are kind of a business use case scenario where businesses can make more informed decisions through data that, that was kind of always around them but wasn't ever being monitored, wasn't ever being run through uh, intelligent devices. And then your, uh, your exercise sensor can tell your self-driving car that you haven't been exercising enough, so uh, the self-driving car will, will force you to walk. Right. Uh, you look, so Ford Sync is actually working on some prototypes that pull in some of that health information. So you actually have a, a HIPAA-certified area inside the vehicle. It's just you, right? So that qualifies under, under HIPAA as a secure zone. And so you could get feedback from things. Imagine you've got diabetes, you see a, a low reading, and you get in your car 30 minutes later, your car could check in on you and say, did you eat the fruit you were supposed to eat? Did you eat a granola bar? You know, if not, before you get in the car and start driving, let's go ahead and address that right now. So we can have these constant prompts. Uh, I mean, again, that's kind of a health and fitness related thing, but uh, we could have those prompts in a lot of different aspects of our life. And then, and then the glove compartment will 3D print your granola bar. That's, that's right.
Okay, excellent. You guys, thank you so much. It's uh, Our time is up. I want to thank Ross Rubin and Sean Duberback for joining me here today to talk about the Internet of Things. Um, for CA members, you'll see, we'll continue this panel with more at our upcoming industry forum, October 20th through 23rd in Los Angeles. Uh, you can find us at www.ce.org and again, at Ross Rubin, at Two Opinions, and I'm at J.A. Joseph. Thanks for joining us, and Ross, John, I look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles. Thanks, Jeffrey. Yep, thank you. Thank you.